We'll give it a few minutes for people to dial in. I'm really excited about this session. It's a bit of a contradiction that we're joined by four of the leading cyber experts in the world and we're hosting this session on Zoom. But at least you can be safe in the knowledge that we have the experts on hand to deal with any cyber challenges we might have. We'll come back to talk about Zoom a bit later in the session. This green shoot session is focusing on cyber and that's been a topic that's crowdsourced from the audience. So thank you so much for suggesting the topic. Please make sure to use the Q&A functionality and we'll do our best to ask our experts the questions that you have and make sure all of your burning questions are answered. If you search cybersecurity in the news, it seems that every day there are many victims from consumers to businesses to, to even countries. And we hope this session will benefit your businesses and help to give you a new perspective on the complex cyber world and why it's so important and even more so in a COVID-19 world. I can see people dialing in now, streaming in. We've got about 100 so far, um, so I think we can get going. I'm your co-host, Rebecca, and I'll hand over to Pat. Thanks, Becca, and uh, happy Friday to all those that are listening in and uh, clearly to our esteemed speakers. Um, we're super grateful to have you involved. So um, welcome to the fourth edition of the Green Shoot series. Uh, in Star Wars parlance, the fourth edition refers to a new hope, and hope and trust are key to many of the challenges we are facing today. So just a bit of background, we started Green Shoots to provide practical advice, insight and clearly hope during these dark times and, and where possible some light relief. Um, importantly, we want to shine a spotlight on the initiatives and the people that can and have moved the dial in our community. So last week, we were super grateful to have three superheroes share a number of initiatives that they're involved in to support the fintech community. And this week, we've, we've kind of upgraded our software and we have four cyber heroes on hand to protect what we have and importantly, protect trust. So on to our first speaker, um, who, is, uh, who needs no introduction really, um, is Ralph Achimendia. And uh, as a child, Ralph had always wanted to be a sound engineer. But growing up in Cuba, he became a hacker. Over time, he grew a conscious and became an ethical hacker. And also, which happens to be a great thing for us, a world-class cybersecurity expert. He's delivered training on hacking and other security information to the US Marine Corps, NASA, Google, and Intel, to name just a few. And this has kind of led him to work with award-winning movie director Oliver Stone. And one of the big claims to fame that he has is that he introduced Oliver Stone to Edward Snowden, which led to films such as Savages and Snowden, which he also provided technical advice on. So thanks a lot, Ralph, for joining us. It's great to have Pleasure you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Pat. Awesome. And uh, our next speaker is, is George. Uh, he's a big Trekkie, as you can tell from his, uh, his background. Um, he's on the, the Starship Enterprise. Um, so what, um, one of the things that he, he idolizes, or one of the characters he idolizes on Star Trek is, is Data. And as a child, he wanted to be a classic car collector. So just a quick question, George. Uh, which car are you driving at the moment? Oh, gosh. I, I've, I am not driving a car at the moment. I am practicing good good citizenship by using public transportation. So I am not driving a car at the moment. Okay, all right, fantastic. Um, that, is, uh, that is definitely good citizenship. In his uh, spare time, he serves as SVP and Chief Security Officer at Gojek. He's been in the information security field for over 23 years and has a keen ability to, to uh, align security objectives with business objectives, which is a, a very good skill and, and a rare skill to have indeed. He started his career at NASA on Earth many moons ago. So it's uh, great to have you on board. Thanks for joining us, George. Thank you, happy to be here. Our next speaker is Paul, who harbored hopes of being an astronaut as a child, which uh, bizarrely, now that's three people on our show that have had the same childhood dream. So it seems to be uh, quite a popular theme uh, on our speakers. Um, in his spare time, he serves as CEO and co-founder of Harangi. Uh, a, uh, a, a Singapore-based cybersecurity company, which has recently raised 20 million last month. His clients include Gojek, Shopback, Ninjavan, and Property Guru, to name but a few. And prior to Harangi, he was at Grab and Palantir. So uh, thanks for joining us, Paul, and uh, congrats on the recent funding round. Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks, thanks for having us. And on to our last speaker, um, who is a closet Bollywood actor that plays the drums and piano. As a child, Jagdis aspired to be in Indian movies. So if you're still interested, I'm, I'm quite sure that Sopnan Du has contacts in, uh, in Bollywood. So uh, there's still hopes to realize your childhood dreams. 
In his spare time, he is the Managing Director at CrowdStrike for the Asia region, a next-gen cybersecurity company, and he's got an impressive, impressive career that has led him to serve at McAfee, Cisco, and Larson Tubro. Thanks for joining us, Jagdis. And uh, one thing um, I am going to ask you at the end of the show uh, is, is a Bollywood song. So uh, maybe you could close out the episode in style. You don't want me to do that with the musician in the group. So I'll... <sighs> Thanks. And uh, so essentially what, what a lineup we have for you today. Uh, the focus of this session is to explore the growing importance of cybersecurity. So let, let's get the show on the road. And we're going to start with our usual repertoire of uh, a day in the life. So I'm going to start with you, George. What does a typical day look like for you? And how do you manage your teams and ensure that they are as resilient as ever in responding to the threats remotely? Sorry about that. I just got off mute. So I start my day at around 8 a.m. Um, I have my coffee. And while I'm having my coffee, I try to push my inbox to zero. I'm one of those OCD people that needs a zero in my inbox. So while I'm doing that, I'm also uh, trying to catch up on the news, what's going on locally, but also around the world. And then, um, you know, kind of look at my calendar for the day, see what's going on. I, I meet with my team almost every single day through either a staff meeting or one-on-ones. Uh, within security, there's always something going on, like an incident that we're tracking a, or multiple incidents that we're tracking, a project that's going on, a presentation to management, a customer meeting, or so on and so forth. But, um, you know, close interaction with my team uh, is really important, and we do that every day. And then, and then lastly, I try to focus on one positive um, act for the day, something that I can to do or help my son or my family to do to, to, uh, to contribute back. So just one thing for that day that we can say, hey, we did it, and then it'll be cool. If, for example, it could be you know, helping the needy in some way or volunteering in a, in a teleconference for a classroom to speak on something. So uh, that's kind of how I start out my, my days. That's great. And uh, we, we certainly encourage everyone to, to get involved and support the community. Um, just one quick follow-up question around, you know, what has been the biggest challenge um, for you? Yeah. So the biggest challenge, you know, uh, working from home for us, uh, you know, actually hasn't been that hard. We, we, we as a company, Gojek is a very dynamic and, and multicultural company. So the way we've engineered our systems and our process and our people means that they can almost work anywhere and still be productive. Um, so that, that gave us a leg up. I, I think where the challenges come in is, you know, most of, used, most of us are used to coming to the office and having face-to-face -face interaction. Now that we're doing that on a screen, it's different. Uh, but, you know, the challenges around that are, are people getting a little bit of cabin fever or, or just not used to having so many of their family members around them as they try to do work. So, so typical things like that. Um, in addition, I think I heard some of my, uh, my staff comment to me, um, they're not as exercising as much. Uh, when they were going into the office, you know, they, they've had regiments like, hey, this is the hour I eat, I work, I do my email, I do my projects, then I go home and I do a workout. The, the work from home has... Uh, shifted that paradigm. Now they're they're more productive, but they're also more busy. So some of my staff members actually tell me um, they're struggling to find time to work out. So you know how we approach that is is typical. We 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 try to set up schedules and and what we do certain ranges of hours for the day, so that we you know we really encourage our our staff or I encourage my team to to uh, you know take time to uh, to work on their stress levels and manage it as well. So, um, you know, all in all, it hasn't been that hard for us, but at the same time, we, we do our, we are adjusting like most everybody else. Nice. Ralph, I'm going to come to you next. You have a pretty unique setup at home at the moment. I hear your household calls you the squad father. Um, so fill us in. What does a typical day look like for you in, in a COVID-19 world? Um, but keep it clean. Ah, okay. Uh, well, um, it, it goes between, you know, cybersecurity issues um from you know like uh, much like george i wake up and actually i use the reuters app to because i kind of look at the news in 30 minutes and uh and then after that um you know begins just uh, dealing with a lot of different issues um dealing uh, with a lot of crisis management issues right now in different ways um there are individuals and companies that are being hacked and uh you know they're finding out about it 
And so, you know, fielding some of those calls and some of those issues. Um, and then on the other side about it, I'm, I'm heavily involved in the entertainment and music space. So we have uh, recording studios here at my house and my daughter's a musician and an artist and, and along with uh, a squad, hence the squad father terminology. And, um, and so managing that world, which you would think um, is, is very different in, in many ways than say the tech world but very similar in other ways too, you know, uh, at the end of the day, their product is like an app uh, or a service at the end of the day. And uh, in every other way, it, it, all the same things apply, you know, the marketing, business development, the PR, all of these different elements that we have to deal with within the tech sector also apply there. Even more so is the issue of cybersecurity. Um, you know, I've had to deal with, for example, the M&M leak uh, a few years back and I'm dealing with a leak right now where an artist's music has been uh, leaked to the internet and um, and and of course then it's very legal it's caught that's a matter of copyright infringement so uh, you have to deal with the lawyers deal with you know tracking down these hackers um, sort of baiting them uh, to give up enough information to be able to nail where they are so there's a lot of that going on that is not going to be reported for a while because the news is completely uh, just dealing with the COVID-19 issue. Um, but that's generally, a, it's a good thing, deal between, you know, fixing problems and at the same time, the, uh, you know, having these, the energy of this creation constantly happening here at the house is really, is really great. It's a great time for creativity. That's great to hear. Certainly creativity, but it sounds like uh, very intense and busy days. And um, one of the things I want to move on to, Paul, is around um, how do you keep your team motivated um, uh, throughout the days um, as a founder? Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, th I think some of the work from home stuff has sort of made it a little bit more difficult. I mean, uh, you know, when you're in the office, you can kind of have those just um, gatherings uh, at random times. But, uh, you know, as we've kind of moved to this work from home, we we've been working, working from home almost six weeks now. Um, you know, like you have to be a, a bit more scheduled around it. So we do Monday and Friday sync ups. So every Monday and Friday I present to the company. Like on Fridays, I do interesting topics along with how the company's done that week. Mondays, we kind of uh, talk about what we're planning ahead for the week. Um, so I think like that's one way we've done it. We also do every morning, we do uh, 8 a.m. workouts. So uh, I lead that on Zoom. <laughs> uh, they're just like 10 minute, uh, just like hit workouts that uh, kind of run through uh, with the team. You know, we started with like a quarter of the company joining. Now we're like at about 10%, but, you know, still holding up a bit uh, there. So I, I think um, that type of stuff has helped. We've also done like a couple movie screenings uh, internally where we watch it over. Uh, you can't use Zoom actually because it blocks uh, streaming, but uh, you can use Discord or other stuff like that, which has been quite quite fun and entertaining. And we did a, a, a karaoke uh, on Zoom as well, which is quite fun. Nice. And same question to you, Jagdish. How are you staying close to your customers um, in a world where we're all working from home? What does that look like? Strangely, I mean, I was used to 26 weeks of flying in a year. So life changed from that extent in one way. But in another way, um, the Crowd Strikers believed in uh, on, on security first culture. So we always believed in that one. And we, we propose that to our customers all the time. And since we are on cloud, uh, on cloud native platform, uh, it's easy for us to reach out and that's what we've been trying to do. Uh, my team members, uh, we've been reaching out to customers, uh, even the ones who are not uh, for help and, and, and different tools. All our business tools applications are on cloud. In some ways, it's business as usual for us, right? Personally for me, again, um, many ways we are in touch with team and, and customers. With team, um, I just heard about some, some great stories from Paul and, and George. Uh, we do that a lot as well. Uh, just the other day, uh, we're trying to play tambola. I don't know how many of you are familiar. We used to call it housey or tambola. We're playing that as some music uh, with the team in the evening. Uh, so yeah, some uh, of staying connected. Personally, I start the day with um, with my workout regime. And since I moved to Singapore, I've always had my trainer joining over Skype. So uh, so for many ways, it hasn't changed for me. Uh, but we're making sure uh, that uh, for our customers, uh, nothing has changed uh, and, uh, and it's business as usual. Thanks, Doug Dish. And, um, you know, we, we want to move on swiftly to, to some cybersecurity based questions. And, you know, with large parts of the world working from home, you know, using personal systems, personal gadgets, um, home Wi-Fi, which is connected to multiple devices in the household. What are the risks of working from home? Um, and I'd like to ask this question of George. Mm, there, there, so this is a, a, a top of mind 
top of mind topic for a lot of CISOs I talk to, right? Um, typically when users start working from home, there's this, you know, the, before COVID, there was already a blur between uh, personal systems and work systems. Now it, it's that topic or that issue has come home to roost. So, so with Wi-Fi specifically, I think, you know, everybody uh, on this call is probably using Wi-Fi to access this call. Uh, basics, right? Go back to security hygiene basics. Have a password, not easily guessable. Uh, um, you know, have a, a network that's specific just for your, you or your family, and your devices to keep others out. I think, I think also more importantly is during this time, you know, we're, we're seeing an increase probably two or three or more times the amount of attacks that are focused on phishing and social engineering because they, you know, the, 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 the bad guys uh, do know that we're all working from home. And so they really target into that, right? Uh, ransomware is another one that uh, I think most folks have seen in the headlines. Uh, I'm glad to have Jack Disha on the call. He'll, I'm sure he'll talk about that as well. And then we're all here on Zoom and everybody's seeing the headlines on Zoom. Uh, Zoom, by the way, it, you know, my opinion, they're one of many with security issues. They just happen to be one that's been really under the spotlight that's been called out. So I'm, I'm, I, would, I would, you know, balance that comment by saying other web conference solutions probably have the same issues and they're taking this opportunity to wrap up their security as well. So, so uh, but, but Zoom is taking the right steps, right? Uh, for us, for, for us specifically, we did a top-down review two months back on Zoom and we put in some basic security controls. For example, it requires a password. Uh, those who are not within the company for coming from outside the company domains will require to be put in place into waiting rooms and admitted one by one. Uh, and we also uh, whitelisted only, uh, you know, our company's domains in, into the Zoom uh, instance that we have. So there's really these basic things that you can do to really move the needle on security. So, so it isn't, oh my God, you know, the, these technologies are so insecure, we can't use them. No, uh, you know, listen to your security team if you have one and, and, and trust in them that they can look at the, the, the setup and help you secure it. But all in all, I, I kind of step back and look at this and, ah, you know, how do, how do cyber threats impact us, uh, you know, now that we're working from home and what the new norms will be, it, it would be essentially around these areas, the basic stuff. Like you said, uh, um, uh, Pat, it would run your Wi-Fi, your, your social engineering attacks, your phishing, uh, all of those things. I'd like to move it on to um, financial services. So Jagdish and Paul, a lot of your clients are, are financial institutions that are now having to um, adapt to working from home and adapt their systems. I was talking to a Philippines-based fintech recently um, who was talking about the challenges of working with clients now in financial institutions where they're struggling to move their, uh, their information to cloud, they're struggling to adapt to this environment. Um, Jagdis, what's your, been your experience in working with, with financial institution clients? And, and then Paul, I'd like you to, to chip in there too. Yeah, um, I think I, I, somehow it's my personal reflection as well. This, this pandemic, this COVID-19 fundamentally is uh, going to change the way we'll do business for sure. But in many ways, it's also exposed the way we've been conducting business. So it's, it's kind of really going to be a massive inflection point uh, with the business models. So... Um, in the security world, uh, it's just not the banks, and it's been largely the theme around that we have relied on signature-based protection for years. And, 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 and mea culpa, we've all been talking that layered approach, signature-based approach, which has worked. But here is a scenario. We've got to change a mental model where the perimeters are out from a, glo a global workforce or employees who could be probably 10 or 20% remote. We're talking about banks and fintechs where 100% of their employees are, are remote. So we got to first look at saying, how can we get out of our reliance on signatures? Because when you have the corporate devices working from home, you can't have an update on signatures and it's not possible. So you got to look at how we leverage on all the new technologies available. I'm sure Paul will talk about that as well. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, use all this power to really start to predict some of the threats. So we're doing that. And I mean, we're asking our customer, all the banks to think of it. Think of cloud as the first way to go. We've been saying that in CrowdStrike for years, and I think there couldn't be a better time with, with, with where COVID-19 might go, but business models have to factor in pandemic for future, right? So cloud first when it comes to business applications and also security would be the, would be the next one. But I think in these times, um, I would say uh, my urge to the banks would be uh, the easiest vector will be access. 
So make sure that the VPN clients, whatever, the, uh, or the multi-factor authentication tools you've got, those are the ones which are vulnerable and make sure they're dynamically patched and integrated. But I think the softest vector would be people. And at these times, we would urge um, everyone to really make sure that your employees are aware of the risk, that they know how to call out the essential movement of a risk, and that would help uh, the organization stay sane and secure. Would you agree with that advice there? So around VPNs and around, I guess, the weak point being the, the individuals that need um, to be educated and need to be um, in the know about the risks. Yeah, I mean, definitely the individuals are almost always the, the, the weakest link and e even most of the technical measures you can probably trace back to individuals as well, even when there is mistakes there. Um, but, but I think generally, like with um, financial institutions, institutions are actually pretty good at managing this uh, uh, type of situation because they plan for it uh, very heavily, large ones at least. And they have lots of budget to kind of manage this risk because, you know, they essentially have all kinds of disaster recovery plans and things like that that kind of put them in an interesting place. I think where it actually hurts a bit more is, is one level below that. So like the mid-market uh, fintechs and uh, smaller financial institutions that don't have the resources to, to sort of prepare for that. Um, and I think, yeah, uh, Jagdish is right around the transition to cloud. I think that's a, a very important shift for a lot of larger financial institutions, which which they are doing. But, you know, you know, it does take time. Right. There, there's a lot of risk to manage uh, from their perspective. And, you know, if they're operating in different countries, there's different regulatory requirements that they have to deal with. Um, but, yeah, I think the, the cloud shift is going to be really important. And I think the biggest struggle for large organizations is that they've managed this like on premise environment uh, for majority of their uh, uh, you know, lives uh, for the, the individuals working there as well as the institutions themselves. And like when you transition to the cloud, um, it's a different security environment, right? Like there's different things you need to, to be cognizant of. There's different issues that can, can crop to you. And some of the issues that exist in on-prem don't actually exist in cloud. Um, and I think that that's where we kind of focus as a company is helping people essentially make that transition and then secure their cloud infrastructure with our, our products and services. It's great that you touched upon um, some of the smaller businesses and I, I want to stay on that topic for a little bit longer and, and before I move on I just wanted to pick up on this Paul um, you know um, how what advice can you give to some of the, the, the bootstrap startups out there that are facing multiple challenges and sadly maybe cybersecurity isn't in the top five list um, what, what, what advice can you give um, to, to help some of these guys out yeah I think the biggest in and you know, it's frankly free advice and something that you can do like tomorrow that you don't have to pay for. It's just like implementing, especially if you're bootstrapped in early stage, is implementing security as part of your company culture. I think if you do that, like it's gonna set you up for sort of success long-term. Uh, and it's something you can kind of control at a smaller stage. I think like once you become bigger and you try to do that like, retroactively, it's a lot harder. Uh, and oftentimes like you'll find mistakes that uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, most scissors can sort of attest to as they've come into companies there. They're often fixing mistakes from the past, but um, you know, I, I think uh, generally the cultural aspect in implementing that into your company, especially if you're a fintech, is really important. So just thinking about it, talking about it, uh, you know, making it part of your core values, making it part of your onboarding, uh, those types of things, it sets you up for success. And then, of course, like as you grow, making sure you implement the technical measures uh, as well as the, um, uh, the sort of people and, and training measures that are required. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing that companies can do, especially at a small stage, is just like make it something you talk about every week. Uh, make it something that's discussed at your leadership meetings, whatever those look like, um, and just make sure that people understand that it's some, a focus for the for the company. Okay, now that that's interesting, and and I kind of want to kind of stay on the same topic, but but ask that of you, Ralph. Um, you know, you, you deal with um, high net worth individuals, you deal with um, big corporations as well as uh, startups, and um, you know, what advice can you give? Um, if we're focusing on some of the smaller businesses, in particular around crisis management. Well, you know, to, honestly, especially with small and medium businesses have, you know, they have the most trouble with this because even before COVID-19, they really don't have the resources that the larger corporations do. And uh, much like, uh, you know, much like Paul said, you know, like within finance, generally speaking, the larger organizations, they, uh, they really understand risk. And, and, and when I say understand risk, they understand how much they have to be willing to pay for that you know, to, to manage that risk. And so with these smaller businesses, it's really a tough one. Um, Paul's point about building security into the company's culture is very important. And it's something that's, that's, that has no, you know, monetary thing that you have to, you know, have some money to put into that. And, and that's very important because the great majority of, uh, of the noise that you're seeing uh, in, in, in the rise of all these hacks during this crisis 
is very much tailored towards the, the lower hanging fruit, which is the, the users, the individuals, uh, be it phishing or ransomware or any of those things. And now the only thing is that the, you know, for, for organizations that have larger groups of people working from home, um, that is now expanding the attack surface for the attackers because most of them are VPN or connected into their networks somehow. And generally speaking, not to say that this is of all companies, but generally speaking, once you VPN in, um, there really isn't much filtering of that traffic into the internal environments. So uh, things can get on your laptop as a person and then uh, reach their way into the servers and, and other environments. Um, with, with such m many more numbers, because before we were sort of behind the perimeter if we were at the office. Uh, now we're carrying the perimeter around with us. So for those small companies, um, many of them are having to adapt to the use of, of remote tools um, to be able to, that they maybe have never used before. And th therein lies a lot of the uh, potential risk is, you know, not configuring the use of these tools correctly or, you know, or, or not using the tools correctly. and opening yourself up for attack. So, you know, for those, for those small to medium companies who are having to deal with this, um, they're gonna have to spend the time to really research what their, what their platforms, whatever they may be using, and ensure that they're configuring it right, but from a crisis management perspective, make sure that they're logging as much as they can and that they're actually reviewing logs um, to look for anomalies in sort of the workflow of your data of the data of that, of that company. And, uh, and that's something that we often don't do, believe it or not, in the cybersecurity space, unless something's happened. So it's uh, to, 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 to basically stay on top of that and be able to monitor the way the traffic is looking. Uh, if it's not normal for a computer to be, speak, you know, to be communicating at two or three in the morning, uh, and you see traffic that, that was taking place at that time, uh, and you know that that traffic, you can't make out what that traffic is for, then it, you know you have a problem. That's one of the biggest issues is that you oftentimes can't figure out what, that you've been hacked until way, way after you've been hacked. And at that point, it's, uh, it's, it's way too late. So I'm hearing there it's about embedding security into your culture, um, definitely using VPNs when you're working from home um, and logging those anomalies when they happen so that you can trace that back. Um, George, I know you're involved in the due diligence process for Gojek when you're looking at working with new partners, when you're partnering with fintechs as well. Um, do you have additional advice to those kind of three big areas that, that we should all be thinking about, but particularly from a, a founder fintech perspective, um, when we're now working from home and, and keeping our systems secure? I, I, I do. Um, you know, uh, in addition to all what, what all of my colleagues just, just mentioned, I would say going back to what Paul said, I think if fintech founders and companies really think through designing security at birth into their products and services, that's a huge investment. Uh, um, maintaining a security program, starting a security program and maintaining it from birth, it's vastly more, more feasible and cheaper than doing it after the fact, like Paul said. Um, in addition, I think it also gives fintech companies an edge if they're able to invest early and achieve things like security certifications because because when fintech comes to partner with other companies or or try to attain customers and whatnot uh they, they go through a third-party risk analysis right most organizations have that and and if you're if you have your security house in order vis-a-vis -vis your certifications your processes your documentation your logging and, and you can justify those things very easily then it's a very smooth process. So it is, it is an investment that, that pays off. Um, in addition to that, I, I would say for FinTech, one of, the, one of the threats that we see or I see uh, within, within that space is around, around, all around customer trust or consumer trust and safety, right? Consumers and customers need to be able to say, hey, I trust that platform. I trust that solution because it's transacting my money, my financial uh, equity uh, and whatnot. And so, and so things to watch out for on that front is account takeovers and fraud, right? The fraudsters were always going to look to take over somebody's account for the purpose of, of uh, you know, fraud, defrauding them uh, from money. So, so there's risk programs within fintech companies. Um, they're, they're very common, but I would say, you know, focus on that early, build a strong foundation so that, you know, your products and services are, are 
as resilient as possible against account takeovers and, and fraud. I, and I think making those type of investments will, um, you know, will save a lot of time and level of effort and, and capital expenditures um, in the future. Thanks, George. And we've had some uh, really good uh, questions come through as well. And um, I just want to thank the speakers for, for addressing this. Um, so one of the questions came through was around five things we must follow while accessing office systems from home. And um, every one of the speakers has uh, pretty much responded to this. So uh, thank you. So if um, anyone in the audience is, is keen to understand the answers to that one, uh, please just go in the Q&A functionality and you can, see, uh, you can see the expert advice that's been given. Um, just moving on to one of the audience questions that's yet to be addressed was around the signals that indicate that hackers are taking advantage of, of COVID-19 or, or your own um, offices. And um, it, it, can you shed some light on this? Maybe um, Jugdish, if you could, uh, if you could uh, share your thoughts. Yeah. So I think uh, even before COVID-19, uh, we're going to look at uh, where the problem was shifting, and I call it uh, the blind spots. So if you look at uh, successful breaches, and um, not a good thing to talk about, but the breaches have been happening, and one unifying theme is, uh, the, the, as, as security practitioners, we've been depending on looking at malware. That malware-centric approach to protect organizations has been a failure because more than half of the successful breaches didn't have any form of malware. And if I have to simplify that, uh, there was no uh, portable executable program loaded on the disk. So fundamentally, you need sophisticated tools and technologies to really detect that. And, and, and so relying on uh, signatures to look at malware was almost giving them 50% blind spot. And we've seen this enhancing in these times because the signatures aren't updated. That's the big problem statement. The other part is, um, and, and Ralph is here, he can, he can add in here as well. Uh, the threat actors are getting faster. We're talking about speeds in minutes now. And, um, and our processes and, and technologies of the past are just not catering to it. If you are dealing with nation state actors, and we track 131 of uh, threat actors around the world. Some of them can be in, in minutes. And so are we able to respond when the if there's an intrusion happening and be able to detect and prevent it? We believe the only way that can be uh, is to move to cloud because the more you're on-prem, you will be slower to react and the game would be over by then. And, and then the other part uh, is that you will not have the collective immunity. I'm just, I'm just trying to pick the learning from COVID-19 as, as we may like it or not like it, but doing a country ranking of who is doing better now, I find it tasteless because the only way we can fight this is all the countries are together, right? I think in cybersecurity, collective immunity is the only way forward. And in CloudStrike, we believe in that. So you've got to have it on cloud, be able to correlate the uh, threats around the globe, be able to make everybody faster because you know why? The bad guys are fairly collaborative. Ralph will, can speak about that. There's a fair amount of collaboration uh, in, and Marvel comic scenario going out there. I think the good guys have to really get more and more together. The only way is cloud. I would say those two are important, but we have seen enhanced attacks because we are vulnerable. I want to know what's going on uh, in, 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 in Singapore about how I can be safe. And I could click on to uh, a website that looks like a safe website from uh, WHO and that happened in the first few weeks. So I think uh, the attackers are tapping into our psychology right now to our vulnerability right now. And to me, you need to have technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning to predict that. I think as long as we start to do that, we will be safe and the future will be about that. Yeah, I, 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 yeah to follow up on that, um, Adish, it's, uh, you're absolutely right about that. Somebody had asked earlier about, you know, what can, they, what can be done about cyber crime? And, and one thing I have to, you know, remind everyone is that if you're, a, you know, a, bad actor, a hacker of, of the bad kind, you don't need to sell cybersecurity to anyone, right? You just go do your thing and you go get your data and do whatever, you know, clone some machines. But at the end of the day, you don't have to sell cybersecurity. We're in a much tougher position in the cybersecurity business because we have to justify the spending required for cybersecurity. We have to sell it, right? They don't have to sell it. So the truth is we are purely reactive. We can say we're proactive uh, all we want, but they are, cyber crime is always proactive and they are a lot better at communicating with each other um, than interestingly enough than we are. Um, because 
they that's kind of the way it always began right it was was sort of this open source men, the mentality of of of, uh, of of sharing and contributing to each other's code it has nothing to do with the the motive right the motives involved with the use of the of, you know take a take a a weapon right a weapon could be used for many different reasons a hammer could be used to build a house or kill somebody so that comes into motive of the use of the tools but the tools themselves um were always developed with this uh very co connected community right and now that community of course that or that the roots of that of course are part of cybercrime and part of cybersecurity um and we are really generally reacting to it the same way that we're reacting to this COVID crisis, right? Um, ahead of this, if, if we were to tell governments that they had to spend, you know, millions or billions of dollars on, on, you know, preparing for pandemics, which they have been told, uh, you, you know, you had to really sell it to get them to, to put those type of budgets. And they didn't, and many of them didn't do it. Now watch, this happens, and all of a sudden we're going to have all kinds of new uh, organizations and departments associated with uh, with viruses in the in the physical realm, but in the meantime, we have just as many, if not more, viruses to deal with in the in the virtual realm. And the two worlds are, have never been more connected. Uh, in fact, they are one. We're no longer, you know, living in a physical world over here and a virtual world over there. We entirely rely on this this connectivity between the two. Let's draw in on some specific examples here. So I don't want to be sensationalist, but I'd like to ask each of you to choose one recent incident um, around a cyber attack or a security breach um, that you want to talk about and share. And really just to focus in on the lessons that we can learn from that and, and what it can teach us. Um, Ralph, I'm going to give you a breather. Um, you seem to be, I'm putting you on the spot here, you're the only one that hasn't answered the question, the audience question five things we must follow while accessing office systems from home. So I'm going to let you just type away and respond to that. I think it's amazing Perfect. to get all of you to comment on that, if that's all right. Um, so then I'll start with George, if that's okay, to, to share a specific incident um, and what we can learn from that. Right. So um, um, obviously, full disclosure, I will not be sharing any incidents at my company, uh, practicing good security, uh, uh, you know, uh, communications practices, but I've been doing security long enough where I've, 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 uh, I've gotten battle scars around, around some of this, uh, all the way back to, to my NASA days. And I'll give examples, probably they're, they're not too recent, but they still apply back to what Ralph said, you know, the, the bad guys typically don't, you know, they don't need to try new stuff because the old stuff still works. Right. So I'll give an example. Um, a healthcare institution in the U.S. in Southern California had um, had uh, malware, and this ma malware uh, uh, was really nasty. It was actually ransomware. Um, they're not a giant healthcare company; they're kind of medium-sized. And what they didn't have in their IT department was they didn't have backups, or their backups just didn't work. So what happened was the ransomware got in; it encrypted all of their data, and this is critical customer data. I mean, they they're having patients that are about to go into surgery, and the doctors needs the patient's record to 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 do the surgery and so on and so forth. And the 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 um, you know, the bad guys were demanding an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, you know, at the time it was, I think it was somewhere around shy of $900,000. I don't know how that amount came about. It was just arbitrary. It wasn't in the millions or anything like that or, or thousands. Um, but what ended up happening was there was a huge debate within the company uh, saying, should we pay? Shouldn't we pay? If we pay, what's the guarantee that we'll get our data back? And, and what happens if they, they demand more money and, and the, you know, the whole conversation. Um, in the end, um, you know, what was interesting was the company uh, treated as a business decision. What are the risks? What are the trade-offs? What are the benefits? And this particular company uh, decided to pay. And lo and behold, um, um, they got their data back. You know, the, 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 the bad people actually gave them decryption key and they got their data back and they were able to, to, to move forward. Lesson learned, have backups and do all of these things to, to make sure that your data is, is resilient. Um, afterwards, when they did a post-mortem on how they, they approached the, 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 um, the, the ransom, they, they involved law enforcement, they talked to the FBI, and the FBI actually showed a really interesting stat, which was 
um, you know, the majority of the times, uh, and this, when I, when I heard about their story and I talked to the, this, their CISO about it, I was really surprised. But the FBI actually showed a stat where the majority of the time, um, companies that pay actually get their data back. Uh, again, I'm not espousing to, to go and do that. Uh, again, this is something that any companies would have to weigh the, the uh, you know, the benefits and trade-offs if this ever happens to them, God forbid. But, but it was just interesting to see that hackers are treating ransom as a business. They don't want to, they don't want to, you know, uh, disappoint or, 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 or lose customers. So they actually view their victim as a customer. So, so you got to put yourself in that mindset. It's a business. They want to run a good business, even though it's nefarious and, and illegal and all of these things. But that, that's just one of many examples that, uh, that I can cite. But that, that's an interesting one to, to, to understand sort of that side, where they're coming from, too. Yeah, it certainly is uh, interesting, but sad. And, you know, it seems like there's a, an honor amongst thieves, which, uh, which is a, a terrible thought. And um, I, I just wanted to move on to, um, there was a recent attack, um, Maze ran ransomware. And um, I wonder if you could uh, bring that to life a little bit, Jagdish, because I know that um, you've done a little bit of research around this as well. So it'd be good to share with the community. I think this was uh, over a week ago. Um, I think we could name the company. It was uh, Cognizant. It's in the press. Um, so yeah, it would be good to get your thoughts on that yeah uh, well George talked about that uh, about ransomware um, yes it did come out in public and there are many that don't come out in public and we try and hide it uh, we're getting a lot of calls around on being affected by ransomware and trying to help customers I think uh, ransomware fundamentally is not a new thing that's happening it's been there for more than a decade uh, we've seen some of these threat actors uh, trying these models, but but in the last few years, with the advent of Bitcoin, it's become very popular because it's pretty easy then to siphon out your money, be able to collect your money, and still be hidden around where the source, uh, where the destination of that money going in. Um, you know, we just did an estimate. Uh, uh, what used to be a 300 million industry three years back, four years back, is projected to be two billion dollars plus by end of this year. So much as we may hate it. Crime does pay, as simple as that. And, and it's getting to the next level, maze. Uh, we're talking about maze here. Um, oh, we, we, we are attributing that to a threat actor known as uh, Twisted Spider. We got these names and graphics for the threat actors, um, you know, the idea around what they do. They're quite brazen. If you go to their uh, handle, you'll see how they're brazen about uh, what they have done and what you should do if you have maze. They're, they're so brazen saying what you should do and what you shouldn't do kind of, uh, you know, notifications to the one who are affected. Uh, but at the fundamental level, we are talking about ransomware getting very focused and there are bank bankers here, there are fintech here. We call it as big game hunting. We're seeing these ransomware players uh, kind of like Maze, who are looking at low volume, but really good throughput. And we've seen Maze um, get asking almost in the tune of seven and a half million plus for each individual target. So we're talking of big money here. Uh, so. My, my submission here is what's a learning? The, well, firstly, I, I've said that before, I'm going to really sound like uh, uh, the uh, beaten track. Let's not rely on signatures anymore. They have proven to be ineffective. So we can't be part of the problem anymore. The second thing, and a lot of security practitioners here, we rely on IOCs. We love IOCs, isn't it? Any kind of compromise. Let's be very clear. IOCs are post fact. They do a good job of telling you what happened, but the game is over by then. I would say build in a culture of what we so call as indicators of attack. You gotta look at the signs, not the tools. And the signs will tell you, as, as, as George was saying, there is a pattern and a sequence when the attack happens. It doesn't matter what tools they're using, the pattern is similar. If you use technologies like machine learning, AI, you can predict that behavior and you can minimize the damage. Of course, we need better hygiene. There has to be a culture of taking backup quite regularly when you're working from home even more so that you can go back and look into your previous copy and you're not susceptible. Because even if you pay the ransom, there is no guarantee that they don't have the copy and that's not going to go out on the internet. So you're dealing with this kind of problem here. So I would say Maze is another example. And then we're seeing ransom where as a service being offered by many threat actors. And, then, and, and that's also topped with more sophisticated tools that they're collaborating. So the payload seems to be changing behind. We've seen ransomware as a service. So that's the kind of problem we're dealing with. That's great advice there. And, and Paul, over to you next. Can you share an incident and, and some of the advice that we should be taking on board, some of the lessons we can learn around that? 
Yeah, I, th I think the one I like to use uh, in, in, in these situations is the, the Capital One one. Um, and I, uh, I've researched this one a lot, uh, even more recently since George fact-checked me on one thing <laughs> the last time we chatted. But um, I think, uh, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, it feeds into the, the cloud misconfiguration. Um, so, like, you know, in this transition, um, as sort of Jagdi is, is mentioning, is very important for a lot of companies to, to make it. Um, you know, there's different challenges that people face, right? And the majority of the mistakes that are happening in public cloud is, is not Amazon or, or Google's fault. It's actually the customer's fault, right? They're incorrectly using the technology or misconfiguring it in a way that leaves something open uh, to the internet. And uh, in the Capital One case, uh, you know, there was actually an issue. I, I think this, this um, person that hacked it was a, a former Amazon employee, so had some information uh, and like basically had written a script that helped them find uh, uh, companies on the internet that had this uh, misconfiguration. And then, you know, did it to 30 companies, uh, Capital One uh, being one of them. Um, but it kind of shows like the, the difference in sort of skill set and thinking that you need to have from an internal security perspective to a nefarious actor perspective. Because um, in, in some ways, it's much easier to be the bad guy uh, because you don't have to you don't have to choose a target. Right. You're essentially looking for someone who's left the front door open. Right. And I think like that's what most people um, and especially the smaller companies, like when you think about security, it's like you basically just got to do the basic stuff. Um, and that will reduce your risk significantly. And then like, as you of course migrate uh, higher up into uh, uh, kind of building your company, building out your revenue and things like that, uh, you know, obviously investing in technologies like, like CrowdStrike, um, you know, is really important. And I think, you know, for larger institutions, it's, you know, it's a necessity. Um, but uh, I think it's a graduated process where like the first thing you need to do is make sure all your doors are locked. Uh, and then you can probably put that fake alarm sign out in front of your house and hopefully one day you'll have an alarm too. Um, but like, you know, it's gradually sort of building your security capability as you go along. And then like kind of that goes back to my original uh, situation of like, um, you know, implementing security as a, a culture it helps you build that capability over time. which I think George and, and Ralph both touched on as well. And, and that really sort of uh, prepares you. And I think in the Capital One case, you know, I actually know some of the people on the Capital One security team and like, you know, they're doing a great job and they still do a great job. Right. But I think the important thing to note is even if you have, you know, millions and millions of dollars of budget or billions, probably in their case, uh, you can still make mistakes. Right. And you have to be uh, uh, cognizant of that. And like what's most important is being able to react quickly uh, as well. Right. And understanding the indicators of attack, as Jack mentioned. But, you know, hopefully you can catch it there. Not everyone can. Um, so you also have to do uh, the indicators of compromise as well. Um, and like we, we we talk about it in simple terms, just protection, detection and response. Like all three of those strategies are important, um, but you need to know that something has gone wrong so, so you can respond to it. Right. Which is uh, I think Ralph was talking about monitoring and things like that uh, and, and log collection and just keeping it right. I think, you know, for us, we're working with mostly. Uh, I guess some quite big companies these days, but uh, a lot of our uh, history of Harangi is mostly working in the SME space. And the problem we face there is like we would come in, they've been hacked or something has happened and they just don't have logs, right? So like, you know, like simple stuff like that, like keeping your doors locked and things like that are really gonna help you like if something bad does happen because I can't actually tell you what happened if I don't have logs that can support uh, uh, the investigation, right? And like those types of things, I think the basic stuff is what the SMEs struggle with. And if you can, you know, do that, those type of things, and again, put security in your culture, you'll you'll be a a, a lot of steps ahead of uh, uh, the average person, your average company. Locking the front door, the windows, the back door, the trap door. Uh, Ralph, do you have a specific uh, recent example that you can share and the advice that we should take on around that? <clears throat> yeah, actually, um, uh, there was a, recently a case where a um, high net worth individual within the tech sector. Um, you know, and there's been a, several of these cases received an email saying, you know, we have your passwords and uh, here's some of your passwords and we have your passwords for all these things. And uh, he, for the most part, he was very, uh, I would say, generally speaking, secure in, the, in, in his workflow. Um, but, but the thing is, our information is in so many different places nowadays uh, that it's somehow one of those databases got hacked. And they were very much kind of, the interesting part about some of these cases is that they're not necessarily like, as, uh, as mentioned with ransomware, um, this is a, a bit of an odd one because they weren't being very direct about what they wanted. Um, it was almost like if they were pitching this, uh, this person for VC money, right? Um, look, we can do this. And uh, which is, it, it's a bizarre one because at the end of the day, they didn't really request anything specific other than to say, 
they even they even created their whole hacker group and the the, the, the kind of communications and materials that they were sending um, even looked like if they were a company, but they were a hacker group. And so it's 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 kind of interesting to see where again some of the motives may lie, um, and the, and that in fact this was some other database that was hacked. In fact, it may be a major one that we all use and may know about, um, and it may not. We couldn't go that far down that rabbit hole, but uh, it was it was it was very interesting to see a case where it wasn't immediately about okay, I want this much money to give you access back. Um, we were able to very quickly respond and, and make sure that we had taken access away from them. Thanks, Ralph. And um, we're gonna play a quick game now. Um, so we've teed up the panelists, but we haven't told them what the, the game is. So I can see them smirking as well. So um, we're gonna ask you a series of questions and essentially, uh, well, as, uh, we're gonna give you a, a series of tools. And the question is around how secure are the following communications tools? And we want you to give it a rating out of 10. So um, get, get your jazz hands uh, ready on, on standby. And so the first one will be, um, so how secure is WhatsApp? Out of 10. <laughs> okay. Can you uh, enlighten us? Are you, is that a zero or three? Three, George. And Ralph, you had zero. Ralph, you want to go first? Or uh, that, that's for me, right, Pat? A quick fire round, yeah. yeah. Go, just just to let us know. I'll, I'll go first. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, WhatsApp is so ubiquitous uh, everywhere, right? And, and nobody, everybody knows Facebook owns them and they purport to have end-to-end -end encryption and it's so easy to use and it's just all of these things. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're transacting over something that it's a, it's a black box. You don't really know, despite what the privacy policy says, despite uh, what the company says about not sharing metadata for advertising or other nefarious purposes. Um, you know, I, my, my philosophy on that is, hey, every, every chat app or every video conferencing app is it, going to have that risk. It, it's a matter of fact checking uh, uh, on, on what the app and the company uh, is reporting that they're doing that they're doing. You got to really check up on that. Um, I mean, if you look at WhatsApp, there, there's been, you know, some suspicions of them, you know, Facebook using that data to use for advertising targeted uh, campaigns and things like that. So at the end of the day, you know, a lot of companies, I, at least I talk to, and I, I know fintech companies included, um, have has WhatsApp as part of their business processes. Company actually use WhatsApp, which is a designed for a personal consumer based uh, uh, communications chat platform for business because it's so ubiquitous. I, I, I have a little bit of um, a problem with that because I think, hey, think through the security and privacy issues of that. You're really putting the data, some, some you know, potentially really sensitive data in the hands of a third party consumer based, uh, uh, you know, uh, design application. So from a security perspective, because of the, I guess, the opaqueness of, of, of something like WhatsApp, that's why I scored it a three. I think that seems to cover it, unless Ralph, you've got a quick uh, comment that you'll add to it. If not, we'll, we'll move through the, the list of other communication devices. Let's keep Which going. Ones? Okay, uh, WebEx, out of 10 guys, show me your jazz hands. I love that. I haven't used it in forever. <laughs> Six. And if I had to ask you to score it on uh, convenience and, and usability, so the experience, what would that be, just out of interest? Two. <laughs> Two people. <laughs> Five. Okay. All right. Mi mixed. Mixed. Um, uh, Blue Jeans. So there was an announcement recently that Standard Chartered is now moving to Blue Jeans over Zoom. So um, what, what's your view on uh, blue colored jeans? Two, George. <laughs> <laughs> Two again. Wow. Wow, oh, one. One. That's not a peace sign. That's not a peace sign. <laughs> okay, Ralph. Ralph, if you've got a quick one liner on blue jeans, what why why two? Uh, you know, it's it's to me it's just one of those that um it, it just adds a layer of, of complexity, which always adds a layer of risk in a way. So uh at least from from what I've seen, I don't know that it's worth it. So we'll see. But uh uh, to me, it just doesn't doesn't uh, come across as creating more value than potential risk. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on to Skype. 
Jazz hands, please. Six is pretty high from Paul. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, you know, it's now on, it, it's, is he even Skype anymore? Or you're saying Skype or Microsoft Teams? Because it's kind of, uh, I guess that, that part was confusing me. I'm thinking Microsoft Teams, but I think for Skype, just the general uh, usage there. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm more of a four. <laughs> okay, a, a one-liner to add, Jagdish? Oh, I think we've all used Skype and, and, and Ralph is right about Teams. So I would say from a user interaction, um, the world has moved much faster. So I'm looking at it from one of you as a user. I still there's a lot of work to be done. Okay, so we've got a couple more. Um, so the next one is Telegram. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I'd say like five. Really? I thought this was going to be the highest to 10, the closest to 10. No, <laughs> George, why only a four? Um, you know, Telegram, TikTok, WhatsApp, all of these things, uh, you know, um, and I, 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 I'm not here to espouse or advertise anything. I actually uh, use almost all of them for various, co you know, communication channel. But again, it kind of the same reasons for WhatsApp. There, there's, there's somebody in between me and, and the destination that I'm talking to. And, and uh, you know, is, is that in between transparent or opaque and, and, or somewhere in between? And that's kind of how I assess it. Okay, that's, that, that's fair. And um, there's one missing. Um, I wonder if you guys can guess the, the missing communications tool, the one that we're on right now. And there's been a lot of press around it. So Zoom, hands please. Pretty high, okay. Super high, I'm curious. Please George. And then Jagdish, um, just very quickly, if you give us one or two lines on this because there's been a lot of, um, uh, negative press recently about Zoom. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first and then I'll turn it over to you, Jagdish. Uh, like, like I said earlier, I think they're on the spotlight and there's a silver lining when you're under the spotlight, everything is shown up. And, and Eric and the CEO has really stepped up and say, hey, we take these things seriously and, and no, no fib, we're gonna take care of it. Um, they took some concrete steps as quickly as they could. In addition, customers had some basic things that we, could, we, did, we did on our end, like here at, at, at Gojek as well. So I give them high marks for, for not the issues, but the way they went about responding to it and, and uh, you know, taking care of the problems. And, and I also believe that, hey, if, if you practice the, the right steps in configuring it, um, you're, you're, you're just as safe as anybody else in terms of, uh, you know, other options. Jagdish or, or Ralph or Paul, if you want to have a quick one line comment, and then after that, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the final question. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure. I, think, uh, I think they've been on the line of fire, but to give it to them, I've been using Zoom for the last two years. I would give it to them that they've changed the whole user experience to the next level. And I think the rest are following. Um, I'm not surprised if they're under fire because they've come out with a lot of security guidelines. I personally feel it's trying to improve. And um, let's look, let's face it today. We are not likely to get on a plane soon. So maybe transportation is a far dream. Maybe teleportation will use up transportation and Zoom is right on top of it. I still feel they're innovating more than the rest. Personal opinion, absolutely. Nice. And that brings us on to a quick fire round um, to finish off around your green shoot story. So something, a good news story that you've heard in the press recently around fintech or around cybersecurity that you want to share. Um, quick fire round. Paul, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think like, uh, like one thing that I saw recently was a campaign that just came out uh, maybe two days ago. I think Ninja Van and some other companies are working on this together, but I'm not sure who all of them are, but it's called SG Pays It Forward. Uh, so it's simply like a cool thing that they're doing to essentially provide um, I guess like health packs, so it's like masks, uh, hand sanitizer and stuff out to the community. Um, and it costs like 25 bucks, but you you essentially pay for that. You don't get it yourself, but it goes to someone in need uh, in Singapore. Uh, so it's one thing that, that I sort of supported recently. I thought it was a, it's a cool idea from the company's perspective, but also to, to help out the community here in Singapore. Um, so that, that I saw it yesterday. And when you asked me the question, I sort of, uh, it pops into my head, but I think that's the one exciting thing in the tech community. I wouldn't call it really fintech, but it's cool that they're they're doing that and thinking about um, sort of getting that that uh, equipment out to people that need it. Nice, George. Same question to you. 
Yeah. Um, so I read a recent article about a small town in Texas where, where uh, because of COVID, uh, the local church was uh, was closed. No more mass, right? So the the local elementary school kids decided to build out a a small place within their uh, their classroom to allow the pastor to come in every Sunday and conduct mass from from the school, uh, uh, you know, over over web conferencing. So I thought that was really really. Um, humble for, for very young kids to be able to do that. And, and they actually learn something out of it too, which is setting up the camera, the, the technology, how to configure it, how to add, a, you know, hundreds of people to it. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, just, just allow the, the community to, to, you know, get back to normal as much as possible. So that was a really uh, touching story to me. Nice. Um, Ralph? Um, I was actually a, a part of, uh, participated in something that, uh, some friends in Estonia put together called the Global Hack two weekends ago, I guess. And uh, we had over 12,000 people on Slack um, and uh, it, about 500 ideas. And at the end, it was about, about you know, somewhere around 120 projects were created. Um, by that, I mean prototypes were built in 48 hours for all kinds of different problems. Um, and it was just a very, a very interesting and, and it, it, getting people from all over the world that way to be working on solutions for these problems that we're dealing with now was uh, great. I was uh, mainly uh, mentoring and judging on or, or uh, choosing the top ones in the media and entertainment section. But there was stuff that, you know, that was related to fintech or identity management or healthcare. And it was just very interesting to see what we can do in, in a matter of 48 hours when we all get together and it doesn't matter where we are anymore because the truth is we're able to work 24 hours a day in many ways, right? Because the world is, is turning. So it was a, a very interesting um, experience. And also it was a hackathon basically, but one of those that <clears throat> really was interesting was that if you guys know a singer by the name of Erica Badu, Erica Badu came on, uh, you know, quietly without telling anyone that she was in these uh, Slack channels. And um, her experience, in the end, she performed, and she said something that was very touching. She said, I think I finally, finally found my tribe. That being sort of this idea of a global hackathon thing. And uh, it was very interesting to hear that from somebody uh, in the arts and entertainment space who was really just kind of popping around in every different subject matter that was on there. So it's really good to see people come together. Interestingly enough, at a time when we couldn't be physically further apart. That's an amazing story. I think we're going to see more of these um, digital hackathons happening around the world. I know we have a number planned um, from MAS's side. So um, I'll flash a QR code at the end of the session on the screen to join our Telegram group, where we'll share more about, uh, well, firstly, the answers to any un unanswered questions that there are here, um, but also some of those digital hackathons we have planned. Um, Joe, just take us away with your green shoot story. I think, are you going to sing us your, uh, your story? No, I'm, I'm not going to sing the story, but I think I can share about something that's, uh, that's been really hitting me uh, pretty strongly. Uh, the lawmakers around the world aren't the most popular ones, the police officers. I don't think they'll ever get a popularity contest rating high anywhere in any country. We can debate which country is better. But I think when I look, see, um, when I see these videos of uh, police force trying to play a band, singing songs to motivate and keeping people positive in these times, it touches my heart. This is not the mental imagery I had about police officers. So I, my heart goes out to them. And, I'm, and I really want to thank all the essential service providers who are keeping us uh, safe and happy right now. And we feel like um, we are on the line of fire. They're the ones really taking care of it. I mean, there are people working in factories right now to make sure essential goods are available. Uh, so to me, my green shoes moment is just the fact that can we all start to enjoy the basic joys of life and go back and give some more with gratitude. I think I've personally been going through that journey. I think we should all observe this more. This is going to get even more important. Uh, we're talking about just can we culminate all our general life-saving skills or life purpose skills at play right now. That's beautiful. Um, and with that note, I think I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining today. Just before we finish, um, I am really excited actually to close with a very special and, and dear to my heart moment. Um, Ralph's daughter is actually an incredible musician in the US. Hennessy, I think she's going to join us. Let me, let me turn off my matrix. On Zoom. Let me brilliant. turn off my matrix and uh, 
and be the proud dad here. Amazing. So Hennessy, I've been fortunate enough to hear her on stage before. Her next album actually comes out on Monday. Um, and Ralph has very kindly shared a preview of it with us. And we've selected a song um, to, to, to tune out to um, called Easy by Hennessy. Um, so Ralph, do you want to introduce the song and, and Hennessy, you too? I do. Uh, so this is Hennessy right here. That, that is her real name. And uh, actually, Hennessy, we, some time ago now, in Amsterdam at Money 2020, Hennessy wrote a, and, and did a song that you guys can find from on YouTube called Privacy. And all I gave her was the word privacy. And she actually did something very, uh, very intelligent with that and, uh, and actually made it something that eventually we're going to release. But this is Hennessy, and you can introduce yeah. Easy. What's Easy about? Hi, I'm Hennessy. <laughs> um, easy is about um, life not being easy and expecting things to come sooner than they do. And just expect to be waiting a lot longer than you expect not to be waiting. Oh, damn. That's bad news right now. <laughs> yeah. COVID-19. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's the song. <laughs> but it does help. And um, and then over here, this is Infinine over here. There you go. Oh. <laughs> and uh, we have a little squad, a bunch of music coming out. And they actually had, we just released a music video called Ready to Go. So if you guys, uh, like most of us around the world, are ready to go somewhere but can't, mm -hmm. it's a fun thing to listen to. So, mm -hmm. but let's go on to easy. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thanks all the panelists and thank you Hennessy for this amazing song. Thanks everyone. Thank you guys. Thank you. Hey, so now we're going to do the... Uh...